right. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Dark Diaspora Africa Renaissance Channel. I'm your host, Pigo, and I've got with me Baruti. How are you doing, Baruti? Mm, I'm John Bolt, everybody. Great, great to see you. And we've got with us today a guest, special guest. Um, uh, his name is um, Dr. Uh, professor Rafael Njoku. He's a professor chair of Global Studies and Languages at Idaho State University. Um, here to discuss with us some uh, issues, various issues, but also in particular about Bantu and Bantu civilization. So, welcome to the show, uh, Professor Njoku. Thank you, Mr. Ihu, for having me, and thank you, Baruti, for your invitation. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. Okay, um, well, before we begin, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a, a little background on yourself um, and, and what, what it is you do, interest. Okay. So um, I was born in Nigeria um, from Imo State, where I had my college education, and then um, taught a little while, less than a year as an Ikoku College of Education, and then came to Europe for my graduate degrees. I was at the Free University Brussels for my master's in European um, history, cultures, and societies, and then I got my PhD in political science at the university also in 2001, before I left for Canada, where I got my PhD in history at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And then I got my uh, first appointment at the University of Louisville, where I taught African history and Pan-African studies for nine years before I got my current position as an African history professor and professor of political science of, of global studies and, and then also the chair of uh, the Department of Global Studies and Languages. Okay, excellent. Thank you, thank you for that. So um, um, how many years did you say you've been um, uh, teaching um, in this particular capacity with global studies? So, um, I spent nine years in Kentucky, and I'm in my eighth year in Pocatello. So I do stay in West Pocatello. Okay, thanks. So um, what what uh, I'll go. We have a number of questions we want to ask from you, but um, um what we're uh, particularly interested in as well is that you've written a number of books, especially on Bantu civilization, uh, Bantu culture. <laughs> history and we've been oh, we've been very interested in some of that so uh, could you just give a brief outline on some of your texts and the, the book you've written and the the um interest that led you to to focusing on those you know um yeah generally i have read a lot about the bantu people but um what brought me to this if you have seen the entire book. Um, I have a copy of the book here, uh, entitled African Mask and Traditions and the Diaspora Mask Red Carnivals. So what you saw is the third chapter of a book of um, eight, nine chapters. So what I'm trying to explain is that I didn't set out to study only the Bantu. But to use the Bantu history and Bantu migrations to illustrate a number of important facts. And one of them is that before the African elements of African culture and tradition came to the Americas, changes were already going on in African traditional societies. And the purveyors of that change we are the Bantu. Uh, we are tracing the Bantu from some part of Central Africa, Eastern Cameroon, sorry, Western Cameroon and Eastern Nigeria. So the point I was trying to illustrate in the book and in the chapter, the primary purpose, of course, there are other things I carefully outlined here, but the point I was trying to illustrate is that so people set out from that part of Africa, about 2,000, 
2500 to 3500 BC and began to move in different directions. But as they moved, they adopted cultures of their host societies and of course lend out their own indigenous cultures. So the fact is all about changes, dynamism of changes in Africa before elements of African culture went through the transatlantic slave trade and then go to different parts of the Americas. And my primary focus was on masking, masquerade and societies. But if you want a literature on the Bantu, I mean, there are hundreds of them. And I started off with looking at the original ones. Now, there are the pioneers of um, Bantu studies. Remember, it wasn't we Africans who pioneered uh, Bantu studies. There are a lot of German scholars like um, Henrik Emanuel Bleek, who began, the, who was among the pioneers, and he started writing about um, 1862. So you can imagine the timeline when they began these studies. And there were also the Portuguese uh, visitors. Uh, navigators who were interested, who were attracted by the fact that they found certain elements of um, words in, the, in Central Africa, in the Congo. And when they moved through South Africa and East Africa, they found the same words all over. And they said, oh, what's going on here? I have heard this word before. And it means the same thing in the Congo, in, in Kenya, in South Africa. How come? So that was how the curiosity and this concept of Bantu came about. So um, if you want the literature, I can send you, uh, you know, the literature. But if you look at the chapter three, um, the footnotes, you will see, you know, things and, you know, if not up to 100 references to Bantu studies. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Yes, I have a, a little question here. Is there an echo by chance on your end for me? No, it's fine here. Okay, fine. Okay, great. Okay, so Dr. Njoku, I'm I'm looking at um I'm looking at some work from the third chapter of of your of your book, third chapter entitled Bantu Migrations and Cultural Transnationalism in the ancient global age. And I want to just, if I could, I want to just um, read just a couple of sentences and uh, then have you to sort of expound on, on, on that if I, if, if I may. Um, as we know, uh, the word Bantu means people and its various variants through many, uh, many African languages. But I found this to be um, very interesting. Uh, on under geographical spread in that chapter, you write the Bantu expansions represent one of the greatest migrations in human history in terms of the number of people involved and more important, its extensive continent-wide impacts, oral, linguistic, and archeological sources show that the proto-Bantu group lived somewhere in Central Africa, precisely in the areas bordering parts of the Bainu Cross River region, Cross River Basin of Southeastern Nigeria and Western Cameroon. It is believed that the first Bantu migrants left this area around uh, 2500 BCE on what would be become an endless and intermittent relay journey involving hundreds of generations of descendants spreading across different regions of African countries. That's one piece. And also you make mention uh, in your writings and summary that everywhere across the African continent has been in some way touched by Bantu culture you also uh, you also go on uh, to mention that for some reason or another, the Igbo language found in uh, Nigeria has been erroneously excluded 
from the Bantu group. Could I get you to uh, just kind of give some reflections on that? First being the idea that Bantu, how you would like to define Bantu culturally, linguistically, has touched the entire continent. And then the second point that you mentioned, that Igbo as a, as a language and culture has been erroneously um, moved out of or disconnected from the, uh, from the Bantu uh, conversation. That's a loaded question. Okay, so let's see how we break it down. Um, let's start with the migration. I don't want you to misunderstand me here or anybody to misunderstand me. So when you look at the literature, some scholars will say the Bantu migration began that 500 BC, uh, some will say 2000 BC, 2005. So I took the middle, the middle range. That's one point I want to make. And then another point, just to reemphasize, there was practically nothing like huge number of people moving at the same time. And the movement was not also like planned or coordinated. Uh, from the experts, we learned that this movement involved families and friends, and they were moving for many reasons. Some of them could be because they were not happy in their ancestral homeland. Some might be looking for adventure. Um, some might have some trouble with their elders at home. Some might be looking for love. So there were all kinds of reasons. So I want to flesh that out first. Okay, but the other issues are directions, they moved. So, because it was individually and family based, people moved in different directions. But I want you to understand that at this time in African history, there were a lot of open lands. So there was nothing like competing for lands or competing for space as they moved they could easily be welcome in other locations. And they were not warlike because if they were warlike, they couldn't have survived. You can imagine you traveling with your family. You try to avoid trouble because alien societies can smoke everybody to death. So they were open, open-minded, but they brought superior culture, of course, and they borrowed from others. Um, Part of that culture, and we are basing this summary on the fact that no matter any part of Africa you go today, even though they speak different languages, you will encounter similar culture. For instance, family practice, kinship systems, patriarchal family systems. So whether you are talking about East Africa, South Africa, North Africa, even North Africa, because my studies are among people in Morocco, the original inhabitants of North Africa, the Bebas, they still practice the same family system we have in other parts of Africa. And I also found out when I was reading the anthropological work of Edward Westermark, he mentioned, and this book was written in 1902, and he was studying the cultures of the Berbers in the 19th century. He mentioned that they also had masquerade culture. I didn't know about that before I started this study. And they were doing masquerade. So you wonder where the masquerade come from. But it, when I look at the masquerade culture, it was nothing they were doing in Europe. I mean, the Europeans and others, they had their own indigenous masquerade culture. It was nothing they were doing there. The African one was distinct. It was unique for the fact that it was part of the political system. And I was able to connect the Bantu homeland, that is Western Cameroon and Eastern Nigeria to the Bantu homeland because if you look at they are masquerade culture. It's about religion. It's about social entertainment. It's about 
politics. So everything is tied to the masquerade culture. But as you move out from that region, and when I talk about the Bantu homeland, I mean Iboland, Efik, Ibibio, Ejo, Ekoi. But when you move out from that region, the amount of reverence on the masquerade culture begins to lessen. That's how you know where the original culture began. So you have the core, and then you have the peripheries. And as the masquerade culture moves from the Bantu homeland outside to other parts of the world, you will find similar practices, but they were no longer intricately connected with religion and politics and social etiquette and other forms of life. It's only in the original homeland where you found every aspect of life tied to the masquerade culture. And let me talk a little bit about masquerade in Mali. Now, Mali today is wholly an uh, Islamic society. But as far as on Islamic culture and African culture have also realized that the Islamic religion was not able to explain spirituality, the spirituality surrounding ma the masquerade culture in the way that the indigenous Bantu people explained masquerade culture. And this is what I mean. I mean, every religion explains spirituality. I mean, in Christian religion, we talk about holy men. And of course, in Islam, they talk about holy men and, you know, and prophets. But they were not able to give them face, image, physical image. And they were not able to explain them in a way that these spirits can speak our languages. They can mimic our languages, run, talk, and bring about greater influence on their audience or their, the people who adhere to them. It was only the African indigenous masquerade that invented that spirituality, but at the same time gave it human form, ability to speak, and to act like spirits, and run, and influence, and talk. So this is what makes the Bantu culture in terms of the masquerade practices different from any other one you can find in any part of the world. So, so far what I'm trying to explain is that this was how this specific culture in terms of masquerade and masking originated from the Bantu homeland and spread to other parts of Africa. Now, what the outside or the peripheral cultures are doing with it is a different thing altogether. Because what culture do, what you do with culture is that you borrow a piece of practice and then you adapt it to the local needs. There is nothing like blanket practice all over. And in my book, I use the concept of um, adaptation, um, the concept of um, prototypes in engineering. So an engineer will design a prototype and then expand on it or change it to their own, to the specific needs. So that's the way you have to understand the journey of the masquerade or the journey of the Bantu cultures across different parts of Africa. And when you look at the marriage culture also, across every part of Africa, and I, in my African history and culture class, I teach about kinship and marriage. And each time I bring up the topic, I allow African students in my class from different parts of Africa to explain it to the class themselves. And it's the same thing we do, whether we are talking about the Maasai in Kenya, or the Igbo in Nigeria, or the Dogon in Mali. It's always the man who seeks the wife, you pay the dowry, you take your wife home. It's always the same culture, but you might call it different things. The same thing with religion, you know, the concept of ancestors. All the different African societies believe in one God, but then they also believe in the intermediary role the ancestors play 
in the cosmos. So again, it is the same practice across the continent. I don't know whether I have answered your question. Is there any part I have left unanswered? No, not not really, except that um, I I I got the part where you're you're talking about the uh, the masquerade, the mask um, parts of the culture, the spirituality parts of the culture have um, canvassed itself o over the continent. But somehow or another, as as part of my um, questioning, it seems like people leave out Nigeria from the Bantu equation generally. For example, most books will go into a discussion about where are Bantu peoples by language on, on the African continent. So Central Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa, uh, Nigeria, and certainly the, the Northwest part of the continent is, is left out. Um, why, why, why is that? Thank you. So yeah, I, yeah. Thank you for reminding me that part of the question. Okay, there are two ways you can look at it, and I think I explained this in my book. L let's start with the geography. So, and this relates to part of your question: Why Cameroon is seen as Central Africa, and Nigeria is not seen as Central Africa? So if you right. look at, yeah, if you look at the map. You see that Cameroon is a little bit, a little bit close, you know, to the right, and Nigeria, especially northern Nigeria, rises up a little bit. But that doesn't matter. Remember, we were not the ones that originally draw these boundaries. I mean, Africans didn't draw these regional boundaries. Um, it was the colonial masters who drew, who drew the regional boundaries. But let me say this: I don't know whether you have read the book of Michael Schasberg. Uh, he's a, an eminent professor in the Department of History at University of uh, Wisconsin Madison. He doesn't use the word north, south, east, west. Yeah, I like the map you brought up. So he doesn't use the, the word north, east, south, west, and so on. He uses the word middle Africa in reference to the area you have brought up now in green, he calls them Middle Africa. Every country, every society within that area for him is Middle Africa. So yeah, part of your question relates to who drew the map and made the classifications in terms of north, south, east, west. And we does do middle mean central? Does middle mean central? Middle. That's the middle there. So but does that mean does that mean central? Yeah, central for him. And he includes every area shaded in green as you projected. Michael Shaksberg. You can look at his book. Um I think I think Family Food or something like that. But it's a historical and political um history. Very interesting book to read. Anyway, so in terms of geographical classification, I think. That's, I have answered that part of it. But then let me get to the other part of your question. So, if you look at the language classifications in Africa, the first question you ask is, who classified these languages? And then you start talking about Henry, Emmanuel, Blake, and others, and Johnston, the Europeans. And then we are doing this as early as seven, late 17th century, 18th century, 19th century. You say, wait a minute. What do they know about African languages? What do they know about relationships between border towns and villages? But then also, what amazes me about this is that the same scholars left an opening of opening for questions. They say, we are just saying this. We are not saying that we are not wrong in some ways. All of them admitted that they might be wrong. I found that very interesting. 
It's just like me coming to Europe in 17th century and start classifying European languages. And saying this is from Greece, ancient Greece. This is from Mesopotamia. This is from China. How do you know? You don't even, you can't even speak these languages you are classifying. They can't speak Igbo. They couldn't speak Efik. They couldn't speak Ikoi. They couldn't speak Ijo. So, then when you look at the Igbo area today and the culture and the languages, then you say, wait a minute. This word, I found it among the Bibio, I found it among, among the Efik. And these are border communities. And then I read the works of Afibo and others. I mean, these are the eminent authorities on Igbo history. And each of them said the same thing that so far as they know, and they are from this area, by the way, these guys are from these areas. It's not like they are coming in to study and then leave. No, they were born in southeastern Nigeria and speak. Afibo himself speaks Ibibio. And they are saying, look, you cannot separate southeastern Nigeria from a fig, from a bibio, from a coin. These people have lived together for ages, intermarried, shared ideas, shared cultures, shared thread, commerce. So the question becomes who will speak up in terms of saying, hey, wait you put Igbo language into Niger Congo without putting it among the same family of languages like Efiki, Jo, Ibibio. And these are the evidence, reason why you should classify them together. Why don't we change the colonial classifications? I think that's what most people have shied away from. And I don't blame them because African history is highly politicized. Once you challenge the experts, you have put yourself on the line for destruction and, and crucifixion. And during our discussion on phone, I told you about one of the reviewers of my book who was mad at me for adding the Igbo among the Bantu. And I gave him my reasons. He said, no, why not just remove it and say, um, Biafran Hinterland? I said, no, Biafran Hinterland is a, it's a transatlantic slave concept. We are talking about things that happened before the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. And we went to and fro, to and fro, and he stopped talking to me till today. Well, but this guy was also teaching me how to speak Igbo. And he was telling me, oh, this Igbo word means this. This ethic word means this. This Ijo word means I said, I've been speaking these languages before you were born. And you are here telling me what my mother tongue means. You see the kind of colonial arrogance I'm talking about? That, that's a pounding on yeah. I found it very amazing. And this guy can't even make a sentence in Igbo or in ethic or anything, except the ones he read on the internet. And then maybe you type in Iwa joke, and then you know the meaning of Iwa joke, and then he memorizes it and says, this is what it means. That's all. But the truth is that Iho and the others, you have been in England or some other parts of Europe for 20 years. You don't claim to be expert on British history. You don't even claim to be expert on the English language. But they come to Africa for two months. They become experts on the Congo, on the Igbo, on the Efik, on the Igala, and so on. Now, that's where I'm coming from. So, so, so th th thank you for that. But um, here's my question. Obviously, you, you talk back about the 1860s or the early or the late 19th century and how a lot of this, these constructs were made by European scholars at the time. They still exist today, or at least they're still being challenged. Is there a push 
uh, with people like yourselves or others that are should be really the 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 grand patrons now of of of, of that new um, paradigm, and should be making the state and the claim to change this rather than keep with what what's been established. Thank you. Very important question. So this is a problem. Some of us are doing that, but you know how this profession goes in terms of publications. Yeah, your manuscript will pass through peer reviews. Mm -hmm. And who are those reviewing your manuscripts? Those who have been socialized into the existing paradigms and they have re already written monumental numbers of manuscripts and books and journals on what they learn from the colonial scholars. So if you turn the table, then you are rubbishing everything they have written and you think they will allow you to destroy their careers like that. No. So they are now like gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. They keep on pushing back. Uh, one of them saw me at a conference and I wanted to ask him why he got my manuscript not this one this was another one he got my manuscript and up to today no response so I wanted to ask him and I was laughing because I, uh, I already know what is in his mind so I went to him and there I said sir um, did you ever got my manuscript and then he held me like this I said, you little boy, this was years ago. You want, <laughs> you want to destroy the earth. You want to destroy your elders. I'm telling you, keep it until I retire. Do you hear what I'm saying now? Keep this idea until I retire. So what does that tell you? He knows I'm speaking the truth, but he doesn't want it published at that time until he retires, because otherwise everything he has been writing will be turned on his head. So this is the kind of challenge you, you face. But then when they retire, they hand over to their boys who, are, who will also continue the gatekeeping business. So unless, and this is my solution to this problem, when you look at the 60s and 70s and 80s, African universities were doing very well. In fact, African history resided at Ebado at Kenya, K um, the Makerere University in Uganda. That's why they were calling them the Bado School, the Makerere School, and others. And then, of course, the one in, in, in Sierra Leone. These universities were doing well and publishing books authored by African scholars. In fact, people of Western world were coming to Ibada to receive their PhD in history. They will prefer to receive PhD in African history at a battle than anywhere in America or even in England. But the university presses collapsed in Africa. And everything went out of the window. You can hardly find an authentic press to publish your book in Africa. So you have to publish overseas. And the colonial masters and their so, and their successors will now tell you what to publish, how to write it, and how to put it. Or you go, you have no choice. Look at all the journals in Africa that we have published in the 70s and 80s, all gone. All the intellectuals are now in the West. So the problem is complex. Now you have a choice to sacrifice your career or you swallow your ideas and move with the mainstream ideas. So how, 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 do you, how do you think we can break from this paradigm? Because we can't continue like this. If our whole um, acad academic or intellectual pursuit is being hijacked by this egocentric paradigm, how do we then break free from it? We can't continue like because already, as it is now, the institutions that we have on the continents largely feed into the same existing paradigm. How do we break free from it? For, for, for those of us that have um, ideas or are intellectuals or academics that 
you know, are suspicious of the existing paradigm. We have to revive university presses in Africa. That's one giant step to solving the problem. I mean, we have good universities in South Africa, for instance, who will manage their presses, fund the presses. I mean, those in the West can easily be the editors of those presses, but then it means that the funding is coming from Africa, and these books are and journals are published by African universities. That's one giant solution to it. Without that, no. Without that, no. There is no. There is no way we can solve it for now. I have a question, um, Ego. Before I ask this question, could you? Well, I think it's frozen for us to see. So you you froze for a second, there, Bruce. What were you asking about? Yes, I, I wanted you to um, pull a map. A map. One that sort of has like a basic African continent with like a, a red uh, circular piece that identifies the the Bantu homeland. Uh, it's probably, see that one on the lower right on your screen? Yeah. It, uh, no, not that one. It's uh, probably that one. It's probably one above it, or this one. Um, oh, we, we can go to the one in the upper upper right. That's that's fine. That's a good one too. Okay. 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 So, Doctor Joku, I, I want you to look at that map for a minute, and that's a a classic one that we normally see. And see how in that one it identifies Bantu Africa, mm -hmm. and then uh, we see these other periphery areas that look like it would be right above Bantu Africa and to the no northwest. I want I want to a ask you this question: um, for most of the literature that we read, even in the Bantu homeland is projected as being in Nigeria slash Cameroon border area. But right now, we'll just say that's Central Africa, including Nigeria. Why is it that we always see that the migration over the continent of Bantu peoples and culture seems to spread uh, to the east, to East Africa, Mm -hmm. to like the center, more Congo area, and then straight down southern. But we are left with the notion that the Bantu migration did not in any way take place to the northwest. In other words, going toward Ghana and Mali and uh, Senegal. Could you, could you speak to that, that a, a falsehood or did Bantu people only move basically to the right? Okay, so two things are here. Um, first of all, the pioneers of the study believe that most of the Bantu people were moving east was because they were looking for agricultural lands so for them going north because of the sahara desert was not going to be very profitable so good number of them moved to central africa and then down to south africa but new studies and i'm talking about studies published by scientists themselves i mean natural scientists they are saying also that the movement down to Central Africa eastwards to the Congo was delayed by several centuries. That was slowed down. Let me use the word slowed down because of the thickness of the forest. So they couldn't really spread very fast. 
remember the Bantu migration was based on the fact that the proto-Bantu people who were moving had superior um, iron technology, which means they were able to uh, design iron implements like knife and hoe, which they would cut the thick set of um, the jungle. But these scientists who published their works a few years ago are telling us that the movement was not very fast as originally anticipated, that they were slowed down because of the nature of the forest. Now, what that means is that much of our focus is on the east, south, and world. And the reality of the fact, again, which goes back to the first statement I made, we are talking about more or less open land movement population wasn't as much as it is today. So it was easy to lay claim to certain parts of the region and either adapt to the existing society or build a new one. So when you look at the central, several parts of Central Africa, the estimate is that the Bantu people do not arrive in certain locations in Central Africa until 1000 BC, 500 BC, or even AD in the case of Southern Africa. So that's why today some people in South Africa call themselves the Bantu people because the memory of that migration is still fresh. So they claim to be in their minds an ethnic block and an ethnic group, which they are not because Bantu is a language. But they are claiming to be Bantu people because the memory of that migration remains alive. If you remember the Fekani movement in South Africa, which was all about the arrival of the Dutch, and in Fekani means time of trouble, you know, the early colonial period of 1650 or 1652 when the Dutch arrived and then encounter them um, the Zulus and the Zulu um, had to go back and that resulted in a, a widespread war or crisis in that part of South Africa with, in which some people estimate about a million lives were lost. For me that was when the Bantu migration eventually ended. Otherwise and that was why I said it was, the Bantu migration was one of the greatest in human history. It was more or less endless. People were moving and moving and moving until they got to the Cape. And then the Europeans appeared. And there was no fresh land to move into. And that was the end. But the point I want to illustrate in line with your question is that those parts of Africa were the last legs of the Bantu migration. That's why they remain afresh as Bantu areas. The Bantu moved in other directions, up north, up to Mali, but not in such a number as we see them moving into Central Africa and Southern Africa. I see. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's all very, very interesting. And uh, I'm just looking at the comments to see if there are any questions from any any of our viewers. Um, so far, none. Uh, there was a comment, I think, from Davies. He said, uh, this is regard, with regards to the um, inability to shift the paradigm of the I guess pedagogy at the moment. They said our historians and lecturers need to push the message. Um, it says that the problem is that teachers in Africa are doing a disservice to our history. Um, th this is commenting on on that, that statement that you made, obviously. And then what what else would you say? Okay, no no other questions. All right. Um, there were some questions we had uh, before. So um, I think you've answered why. The no, I don't know. If, I'm not quite sure if you answered. I know we were, you said we were moving, but I think the other question we were said was why. So oh, okay, no, my question is so the Bantu people, besides moving centrally and southern wise, 
did they also move westward or were they always in the West in general and then started moving elsewhere? How, how would you describe that? Okay, thank you. So um, there were different directions okay. and different timelines. So when you go to East Africa, for instance, the Kukuyu people, they are Bantu people. And it's amazing, you know, each time I meet my colleagues from Kenya, they always think I'm from Kenya. <clears throat> yes, it's amazing. It has not happened, it has happened not once, not twice, not three, any time. And it amazes me, I always pretend, I say, hey, why do you think I'm from Kenya? You say, but your last name shows that you are from Kenya. So Njoko is also found in Kenya. And then I say, what does it mean in Kenya? They say it has to do with agriculture. I say, okay, that's what mine has to do with also. Because in the indigenous Igbo society, if you are Njoko, it means that you are in control of the land. You are the master of agriculture. and most of the time, like my grandfather was in charge of sharing the land. So they were land owners. And it has to do with agricultural religion and harvest. And those in Kenya explain this to me and it's amazing to me. So if you go to the border between Kenya and Somalia, you also find Bantu people there, the same culture. So they were up, down, this direction, that direction. Remember, family size movement. They were not conquering anybody, but they blend into people. But you know what happens when you migrate? You hold on to aspects of your culture, especially something that has to do with religion. You hold on to it. it I think it's the probably the last part of you that might undergo adaptation or influence or change. What you deeply believe in, if the kind of ideology that your parents and your culture implanted in you when you were growing up, you don't share it so easily. So despite the small size of these pockets of migrations, they hold on to those those overwhelming, those powerful forces of culture they inherited from their um, from their ancestors. So even though they might be outnumbered in their locations, they held on to it. And what happens when two cultures encounter? The superior one will always prevail. Look at Western education. Western education has prevailed around the world because it's superior, whether you like it or not. But then we forget also that there were other systems of socialization before we got Western education. What happened is that we have to forego those because Western education is the best and the most powerful and the most influential. When you come to the Bantu migration and Bantu culture, Bantu religion, Bantu system, age grade system, secret societies, they, were, they are powerful and they were able to take precedence among alien societies and those societies adapted them to their indigenous practices because they found them very compelling. So two people can conquer a culture so far as people found your culture very appealing. Look at the Hausa people and the Fulani people. The Hausa people don't speak Fulani language. But the Fulani conquered them militarily. But they conquered the Fulani, the ling the Fulani linguistically because their Hausa language is superior to Fulani language. That's how things happen. Just like African music conquered the Americas. Because African music is superior, but Africans did not outnumber the indigenous people and the Europeans. Mm -hmm. So this is the con context in which you understand the Bantu movement and how they were able to establish their culture across the areas they found themselves without being militarily dominant. 
Another thing, another aspect of the culture is the democratic society, the political system. Democracy was born in Igbo land. Democracy was born in Ibibio land. From the ancient times, you can describe that indigenous political system, compare it with ancient Egypt. And the symbol of that democratic culture is the age grade system and secret societies. Those were forces of political power. Everybody was involved. There was no centralized system. If you go to certain parts of the Congo, you found it. Among the Kukiyo, you found it. Have you read Facing Mount Kenya by Jomo yes, Kenyatta? Yes, yes. Go and read it and come in. Jomo Kenyatta speaks like an Igbo man and acts like an Igbo man. Just a minute, please. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, so go and read it. What what was Jomo Kenyatta emphasizing? He was always talking about our democratic society that, that the British had destroyed their democratic culture by imposing the tyranny of colonialism and that all they were asking is let's go back to democratic system and the, the, the british don't, colonial powers don't want to listen that was the quarrel between jomo kenyatta and the british colonial governors and what did they do they singled out the kukuyu as the bad tribe the rebellious tribe and wanted to wipe them out that was what they the, the, the uh, rebellion that began in, in 1950s to the British left in 1963. See, okay, so I, I the, I guess, Western um, intention in trying to subdue the um, the Western intention in trying to subdue this knowledge or this unification of, of, of Bantu ideology across what they describe as Sub-Saharan Africa. But there are even some of us, uh, some fellow Africans, who believe they're in some some ways from a different stock. So, that, and that's why I also feel the further west you go, um, so someone like from Ghana may not see themselves as having any, anything to do. With uh, with Bantu civilization or culture, Yoruba people, for example, um, you know, believe that they come from directly from Egypt. So there's some that say they come um, that they, they came from ancient Egypt um, when they dispersed from there, and then some other people like from Sudan. Um, so I know you initially talked about when the migration happened, people met other people and uh, imbibed some of their cultural practices with their own. And kept on migrating. So, would you say that there was some, there are some marginal groups, so to speak, or some other groups that did not were not part of the Bantu migration or Bantu culture or civilization that existed there? Absolutely. I mean, it would be redundant for anybody to claim to claim that everything in Africa today is about the Bantu. No, it cannot be. Mm -hmm. It's just like, like yeah some people also you know put this assertion that everything about africa today is about egypt no it cannot be the question that we should ask is which elements of neighboring communities culture did we borrow and which ones did we give them or we give others i think that's the most relevant question Again, I have emphasized that when you borrow an element of culture, you're always going to ask yourself, what do I do with it? If it's not relevant to you, you drop it. If it's relevant to you, if you found it meaningful, you reinvent it, you reinvent it and adapt it to your own culture. But the whole idea of um, any society in Africa um, trying to establish outside migration. I think um, Adil Afibu has addressed that question as very 
um, ridiculous. It's like people trying to find um, noble ancestry. You know, okay, you are not proud of your your heritage. You are not proud of your ancestors, and you want to use um, cultures outside the continent to uh, give a prestige to your indigenous indigenous uh, ancestry. So. Um, did the Yoruba come from Egypt and or outside the, somewhere in the Middle East? I don't think so. Did the Igbo come from anywhere around that area? I don't think so. Am I going to say that maybe one or two migrants didn't move and came back? Ab absolutely is possible. No, people moved a lot in the ancient times than we are moving today. That's what some people don't realize because in the ancient times, you don't need visa to go to anywhere. Um, so far as you can move, you move. Uh, when I go back to my village, for instance, I'm amazed how many strangers live in my village throughout my childhood. Nobody ever mentioned that. Because they do, in those days, societies accept strangers and indigenize them and make them their own. And in my book, I did mention also that the people we call the Igbos today may have changed extensively because people move out and move back in. Mm -hmm. So the Bantu migration was not all about out, 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 out movement. No, you, you, you come to London, you don't live live in London. You pack your things and go back to Benin. Some people have done that. So then when you move back, you bring also ideas you found in London to Benin and establish it in Benin. Mm -hmm. and young ones will say, oh, that guy came from, came back from London 10 years ago, got this idea, and he's now a millionaire or popular in the area. So it's all about borrowing. So the Igbo borrowed and lent. It's not like they influence every aspect of the pe people's lives they made. No, that is impossible. It's a two-way, three-way traffic, cultural, cultural dispersion. Mm. And adaptation is a two-way traffic. I agree, and that, and that and that's what some people don't don't seem to. I think some people have an idea that there's this. How would I describe it? Cultural purity no. that that exists, that, that that it has to be. It has to have certain milestones and certain elements for it to be this culture. But there, it's always been fluid it's over fluid. time. Yeah. Look at the uh, Edo Edo and uh, Delta Igbo, because they are neighbors. They have been mixing culture across the centuries. Mm. So until somebody came and put a, a, a line and say, oh, here is the boundary between Igbo and Edo. Mm. That's not the boundary. Somebody else could have moved the boundary 10 miles beyond. So those, especially those border societies, they are very fluid because in the pre-colonial times, the concept of Igbo, Edo House, or Yoruba is not the same as we have them today. People hardly identify themselves as Igbo. People hardly identify themselves as Yoruba until Samuel Johnson came up with the history of the Yorubas and invented traditions of the Yorubas, put them in writing. So it was fluid. Haven't you heard about stories about Igbos and the Jibu people being the same. Haven't you heard stories about that? Yeah, a lot, of, yeah. a lot of people believe in Nigeria today that the Igbo and the Jibu are the same. That they think alike, they act alike, they behave alike. So, unfortunately, we didn't document all these histories. So, yeah. let me clarify one thing. When you talk about those who are against the Bantu idea, pushing back. I want to I want you to put it in a nuanced form. They push back on one or two reasons. One, they say the Bantu migration happened maybe 3500 BC. So that's like 5,000 years ago or more. They say it doesn't matter anymore because there is no evidence, overriding evidence, or documented evidence. So why do you dwell on it? 
If you want to push it, show me solid evidence. There are people like that. And if you can't show them solid evidence, and they know you cannot show them in terms of this book was written 3500 BC, or this evidence has been here 3500 BC, just like we see in among the ancient Egyptians, their paintings and their drawings. You know, you can use that to support their yeah, evidence. So, but these people know we cannot find such things to support similar claims. So for them, you cannot convince them. So, I mean, you, 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 you accommodate them, you know. So I'm not saying they don't have good reasons to, to reject it. But the fact is that The Bantu migration explains the harmonization of culture across different parts of Africa. It illustrates the dynamism of African culture in terms of change and adaptation. Life is not static, whether 3500 BC or today. People are always reinventing themselves and changing their practices and belief and belief systems and all that thing. Uh, I, I also believe in, um, with regards to the expansion, expansion or non-expansion of myth, that I think part of it perpetuated by the um, by the colonialists at the time would have been to prevent or to prevent any kind of interference with the, with the slave trade going on. On that, on that, um, on that coast, because a lot of it will be on the western coast of Africa, on West West Africa. So uh, perhaps that could be a reason for trying to demarcate Bantu people from West African people as being one and the same, as well as not to interfere with the kind of solidarity with the rest of the wider continent. Uh, it's, it's just just a thought. There could be other insidious reasons as why, well, and just causing disunity in general. What, what, what I mentioned that uh, to preface this because we've talked about something called a, a Bantu Federation, which is an idea that because there's so much similarity between us all, from Kenya to South Africa to Central Africa, etc., that and and that these borders and demarcations that have been created are artificial and done by the European again for other insidious reasons. That would it, it, it might even be more sensible to create more of a, a wider state for, of this sub-Saharan Africa, which we coined like the Bantu Federation, because what is a nation? A nation is um, people of similar culture, food, practices, spirituality, belief systems, etc., And that is what we all share in common. So if there is one real nation, it would be uh, the Bantu Federation, one that comprises all of us in a loose fitting, of, of, of no non-borderless states, different, uh, different, uh, I guess, cultures all in between, intermingling freely and moving, moving quite freely between um, the different regions, as is going to be the case with this new, newly launched African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on what you what you think about that. You know, it, what you have just described is very interesting. It sounds to me like um, um, the an African ideology behind um, OAU, Organization of African Unity, or even the AU, yeah. which uh, Colonel Gaddafi was pioneering before he died. And the whole idea was to, of course, we know Nkrumah was a pioneer of all these ideas. Um, the whole idea was to have uh, one United States of Africa uh, so that we have one high command and then one one currency which he called afro and then one passport and uh, of course a very influential uh, market now in terms of bantu federation um it can exist as an idea as an idea in the making but i honestly doubt is possibility of succeeding. And this is my, my reason. One, where will Nigeria fit into that idea? 
let's say southeastern nigeria identify with it the hausa people are not part of the bantu group the yoruba people just as what you, we have just mentioned are not part of the group they actually belong to different language groups the houses are in the asia aquatic um, language group or nilo nilo and then of course um, um the yoruba they don't cl classify them as part of the bantu speaking people but the point i want to make here is that for that idea to succeed then it means that the Igbo will willfully decide to join. But what would the Nigerian government say? That would be another secessionist struggle. Even when you come to Central Africa, not all societies in Central Africa are Bantu. Even though they are, they were influenced by Bantu culture and they influenced Bantu culture. But not all of them self-identify as Bantu people. The same goes to Eastern Africa and southern africa so the point i'm trying to make is that it could be a useful ideology for peace for cooperation for harmony but not one that will establish a political a political um, nation who will lead that nation from south africa from kenya from uganda somebody from nigeria from Cameroon or what? Well, the, the concept that I, I mentioned was it would be a sort of a, a kind of council. The leadership would be made up of a council, sort of the way you have in the United Nations, etc., where the international bodies that are, they have councils that deal with various aspects of, of life, which is defense, healthcare, uh, etc. And it wouldn't be a, a kind of one singular uh, presidential system or prime ministerial system so to speak okay that's absolutely, what I think. absolutely. Yeah. that will work you know as a kind of um especially if you couch it as a, an economic block an economic cooperation group mm. just like the european union when it began afresh the european market uh, mm. you are seeing now eu is encountering problem when there is an overreach when sovereignties of member nations are being uh, impeded upon. But if you leave it as an economic block, cultural association, um, a forum for unity, a forum for ed educational promotion, and then allow things to, you know, allow things to evolve by itself. You might get there, who knows, when all of us are gone. Um, but, I mean, for me, anything that will promote peace in Africa is always welcomed. Anything that will promote unity is always welcomed. Um, may, may I make one... Yeah, sorry, I, I just wanted to make one, one, one quick uh, point uh, on that. Um, Dr. Njoko, I wanted to just add to your comment. I'm not sure whether I'm pushing back on your comment at all, but at least adding to the, the mix. I wanted to um, just read one sentence fr from your book. Um, you say, through this process of uh, like cultural diffusion, you said the Bantu migrations helped in facilitating the creation of human settlements across the sub-Saharan African region, and they facilitated and modeled the evolution and development of what we commonly refer to today as, as African culture. So when I, when I read that, basically what I look at that as is that Bantu culture is the ground root today, uh, influentially, of the, the continent generally as, as a whole. So where I'd like to get your, your thought and perhaps rebuttal or, or what not, or critique of what, what I'm saying here is that it seems to me as though you, you have been talking about Bantu in a cultural sense. And I agree with that completely. 
um, because we know the word Bantu means people. So let's just replace people with our, our people, our African people. And sometimes we read in the literature sometimes that Bantu is a language term, linguistic term, and people look at that narrowly so that when Ego asked the question about, well, there might be some people in Ghana who say, well, I'm not, you know, Bantu, I don't have anything to do with those people, but can, can we not lift Bantu out of just the linguistic to look at cultural? And then if we look at it from a cultural standpoint, and we just say Bantu means people, then we don't have to get into the narrowness of the linguistic, because to me that in a pan-African sense would help link, link us together. So do you think that that can be done? And is that a problem that Bantu has been used, has been used too linguistically, but it needs to be made more cultural to sort of hone in on the things that you talked about, about gluing different peoples of the continent together by an overlap. Oh. Bro, see you closing again. Yeah. Okay, I don't know if you got, oh, he's back. Did, did you finish your, your, your question? Yeah, yes, I finished that. I'm not sure whether Dr. Joku heard my question. Yes, I did. Okay. Yeah, I, think, I think you nailed it on, you know, on the head. Yeah, you know, if we push the cultural element, that would be more acceptable to a lot of people. And I think also that's the direction to go. Um, but if we make it sound political, then there's a lot of people will suspect whether there is a political agenda behind the ideology. But yes, um, you. I think you interpreted it right. Let the people know that Bantu just means people, and people here will mean African people. And say this is how, for over 5,000 years, our cultures have been mixing from different parts of the continent to the other. So we are all Africans. And that is it. Great. Okay, as, as we're wrapping up now, I just had a, a question or two, because I know you're, you're pressed for time. I really, really do appreciate you being here. So um, I think uh, one of the other questions I wanted to ask is, are you aware of um, there's some other institutions in Belgium, one called uh, Bantu Gens, it's literally a department in the university there, which is solely focused on Bantu studies, and uh, and all things Bantu. And uh, if, if not, what, what do you think about that? If you, if you go to that. Yeah, Baruti introduced me to the website and I've taken a lot of time to look at it. I think they are doing a marvelous job. Um, the good thing is that, you know, what I found amazing about it is that they are so devoted to the idea than we Africans. Mm. Yeah, I found it very amazing. It reminds me how the entire Bantu studies came about. You know, from people of European descent opened our eyes to these cultural patterns across the Atlantic. I'm sorry, across the continent. And you know, with the amount of resources they are putting to that, I think uh, we should watch out for the results of their studies. Indeed, excellent. So, um, well, I don't have any further questions. We um, really do appreciate your time with us as uh, Professor Njoku, Professor and Chair of Global Studies and Languages, Idaho State University, and author of a number of books, uh, namely uh, The Across the Screen History of Somalia, The Greenwood Histories of Modern Schools, uh, United States and Africa Relations, 1400s to the Present, um, African Cultural Values, Equal Political Leadership in Colonial Nigeria, 1900s to 1996. And uh, culture, culture and customs of Morocco, culture and customs of the world, and West African masking traditions and diaspora masquerade carnivals, history, memory, and transnationalism. So, uh, uh, th thank you very much. Um, we we'll hope to see you again soon. Sometimes it's been very interesting. I don't know if anyone else had a, any final statements or comments. Well, um, I, I want to thank you very much, uh, Dr. Njoku, for spending a little time with you, with us today. Um, 
sometimes on our shows, I usually try to come up with some kind of proverb that may be meaningful to what we're talking about. I wrote it on the, the chat screen, but I'll just say it. Um, traveling means finding. That's uh, from Uganda. And I kind of um, thought that might be apropos given your conversations about the migra the uh, Bantu migration and finding contact with others, blending culture, cultural diffusion, and from that, a continuous spreading and a continuing evolution of, of knowledge in many things that you talked about, um, metallurgy, um, uh, language expansion, farming, et cetera. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure, you know, chatting with you guys. And uh, I tell you, I'm honored to be your guest. Thank you very much. We we gotta have you you back though. As you go, I I've got to say when you said uh, Western education is superior, I, I think we have to have you back to to discuss, debate, and and, and discourse about what 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 makes education Western what makes education African and is there such a thing as Western education and what does that mean? Um, we're going to have a section on that. Yeah, we're going to have a section on that, but let me say what I mean by Western there is the system, the system of transmitting knowledge. I'm not talking about the knowledge, the content itself. I'm saying the system. Let's leave it at that until we meet again. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, thank you all for those in the chat room as well. Thank you for your comments. And uh, yeah, look out for our next show, which will be online tomorrow or the next. But thank you, everyone. Thank you. thank you so much.